Hi, my name is Krista Robinson. Welcome to the Consumer Confidence Report Basics webinar. I'm with the Drinking Water and Environmental Health uh, Unit. And today we're gonna be going over all the requirements of the Safe Drinking Water Act for the Consumer Confidence Report rule. To start, the CCR is basically an annual water quality report that every community water supply publishes for their consumers. It's really a great way for them to share important information as well as show how proud they are of their water system throughout the year. The CCR rule does require that every community water system prepare and distribute this water quality report and it has about eight requirements. Four of them are information regarding source water, detected contaminants, compliance, and educational information. It's important to note that you can always add more information to the report, but there are uh, minimums for what is required within the document. So the purpose of the CCR rule is to help protect public health. And we all know that there are multiple barriers to um, uh, protecting public health, four of which are source water protection, treatment, monitoring and compliance, and community involvement. The CCR gets at that community involvement mechanism because we all understand that a more educated uh, public can have um, the, our first line of defense for seeing if there are any issues with our water supply. And we wanna be able to be as transparent with them as possible. I like to think of the CCR as an ingredient label for a couple of reasons. So first, it's full disclosure. You're talking about what you detected in your water system throughout the entire year that you sampled. You don't wanna talk about what you didn't detect, which is similar to an ingredient label. You're only listing things that you detected. Secondly, an ingredient label is on every food packaging. However, not every consumer reads it or maybe even knows it's there. So it's important that we also educate our public so that they understand that they can go to this report to find out more information about their water. A few fun facts about the CCR is that it applies to consecutive systems as well. These are the public water supplies that purchase water from a wholesaler community. CCR units is actually a real thing. Uh, it is meant as a way to make it more readable for the public so that they can understand some of the uh, very small uh, data sample results that we get back on our reports. Another fun fact is that sodium must be included in every CCR no matter what. The reason for that is so that people with heart issues know how much sodium they're getting from their diet as well as their water. And the CCR includes data going back for five years. How this works is that you list the most recent data that you have, no matter uh, when you sampled, as long as it's within this five-year period. Because we all know that we don't sample for every contaminant every year. And in 2019, we have some new requirements for lead and copper, which I'll go over uh, later in this PowerPoint. It's important that we make sure that um, these new additions are addressed and included in our future reports. There is no set template for the CCR. We do offer one on the Eagle webpage. If you go to michigan.gov slash community water and click on reporting forms, you can find the current year's template available for download. It's a very simple uh, find and replace type of report where you can um, simply just type in your name for your water system, all of your information, and add your results to the water table. And it has all of the already required language included in it. So the CCR is required federally in the Safe Drinking Water Act 1996 updates. It is for community water supplies only, so this does not apply to non-community systems. Like I said, there are eight content requirements of it. They vary from uh, what's required in the data table to what's required uh, in language that you have to include. And the Michigan rule actually has two extra requirements of the CCR. So the first is extra language for six different contaminants. If you have levels above an action level or an MCL, you're required to add 
uh, language for these six contaminants. An additional requirement for Michigan only is the sodium requirement. That is not a federal requirement. So you must put sodium on every report, even if it was non detect in your last sample result. So the most important thing about the data table is that you are listing detected contaminants. And how we define a detected contaminant is any related, regulated or unregulated contaminant um, that was at or above its method detection limit. We consider any unregulated contaminant, those that were sampled under EPA's UCMR, which stands for the Unregulated Contaminant Monitoring Rule. And any regulated contaminant is that that is subject to an MCL, a treatment technique, or an action level. The detects table is the main table of the CCR, and how you're going to fill it out is by putting in the highest compliance level for each of your detected contaminants. And by compliance level, we mean is it determined uh, compliance based on a running annual average, a locational running annual average, a single sample result, a 90th percentile? Uh, it doesn't matter based on what contaminant it is, but that highest compliance level needs to be listed. The range of levels also needs to be included in the CCR text table. And this is the range of levels from the lowest to the highest individual sample results. If compliance with the MCL is determined annually or less frequently, you're going to want to list the highest level detected. And if, it's, if your compliance is determined by calculating an RAA, then you're going to want to list the highest running annual average and range of sample results. So you're going to have to know which contaminant uh, you're using and how the compliance is determined for each specific contaminant. If you have any questions, about which numbers you need to list in the report, please feel free to reach out to any district staff or to myself. So I mentioned CCR units earlier in the presentation. And again, these are EPA's way of um, making it easier for your customers to read your data table. So the way the CCR units works is that the MCL of each contaminant should be displayed in a number greater than one. So we have an example of an MCL for selenium that is 0.05 parts per million. Because this MCL is below one, it must be converted to parts per billion. So to do that, we multiply by 1,000, we move the decimal place over three, and we get 50 parts per billion. So 50 is above one, and we need to also display our results in parts per billion so that it matches the same units. So the reason that we see lead and copper needing to be displayed in two different units is because of the CCR units concept. Lead has an action level of 0.015 parts per million, which is below one. So we have to multiply that, that by 1,000 to get it into parts per billion, and that's where we get 15. Copper's action level is 1.3. And that number is already above one, so we don't have to multiply it by 1,000 to get it into parts per billion. So that's why one is in parts per billion and the other is in parts per million. So when we're talking about our data table related to our entry point chems, anything from arsenic, uh, fluoride, barium, any of the metals, the radiologicals, our SOCs, VOCs, things like that, you're going you're gonna to want to uh, add in the highest level detected and the range for each of those contaminants. If you have more than one entry point, that's where you're going to put the range from the lowest to highest of the results for all of your entry points. Now we see in this table that chromium has a level detected of zero. So that means the supply sampled for it but didn't detect anything. And technically, it needs to be removed from the table because it was not detected. Remember, this data table should only include data of detected contaminants. The only exception to that is sodium. When you're displaying your bacteriological data, so for total coliform or E. coli, it's slightly different than it has been in previous years before 2016 because of the uh, initiation of the revised total coliform rule. 
Now that total coliform no longer have an MC out, you are not required to list how many positives that you have. You do have to list how many E. coli you had in the distribution system or at your raw wells. This is an example of how you can display your data. It's not the only way that you can do it, but if you're looking for a specific format, feel free to use this. With the revised total coliform rule change in 2016, it brought some required language differences to the CCR rule. So there are a lot of if-then scenarios for whether or not a supply had to do a level one or level two assessment in their supply during the year covered by the report. If you had a level one or level two, you have to add in language explaining what total coliforms are, how many level one or twos you had to do, and how many uh, corrective actions you had to take. If you had any MCLs for E. coli or a level two assessment due to an E. coli, you have extra language as well. All of these uh, additional language paragraphs can be listed in our template and you can go uh, and, and look at the instruction section to see what kind of language you need to add. There are specific um, sentences that need to be included in your report. Lead and copper also has a required paragraph for every CCR, even if your lead was non-detect. It hasn't changed in years since the CCR has uh, was promulgated. So it always starts if present, elevated levels of lead can cause serious health problems, et cetera. It should end with EPA's uh, website for safe water slash lead. It's a really good way for your customers to understand how they can reduce their own exposure to lead uh, since so much of it relies on individual plumbing. So remember to always include this paragraph in your report no matter what. When you're displaying lead and copper data, you wanna include the most recent 90th percentile that you have for your system. This is given to you by Eagle staff. It should be sent in a letter after you're done sampling for lead and copper. If you have questions about calculating the 90th percentile, please feel free to reach out. In addition to the 90th percentile, a new update for 2019 is the requirement to also list the range of individual results. So this range is uh, for both lead and for copper. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the total number of samples that you had to take for lead and copper and take your minimum and your maximum and list it here. What you also need to do is add in the number of detections that you saw above either action level. So even if your 90th percentile was below your action level, if you had any individual home results that were over, you have to list the number of those samples. And you have extra language that is required. This language is also listed in our template under the instruction section so that you can get it included in your report. So another new addition for the lead and copper rule is uh, dealing with the lead service lines. If you have any lead service lines or service lines of unknown material in your system, you have to include the number of those service lines, either the number of lead service lines or the number of lead service lines of unknown material. Um, or if you have both, you have to list both of them. And then you also need to list the total number of service lines in the supply. That way you can give your customers a little context instead of saying we have uh, 100, service, uh, 100 lead service lines and uh, 100 that are unknown material. Uh, they don't maybe understand exactly how much of their water system uh, that includes. So if you say we have 100 of each out of 1,000 versus 100 of each out of 200, uh, it really does help your consumer to understand the context of those numbers. So this is a requirement. Please don't uh, miss putting this in as we might uh, require that you redo your report for it. So what if a violation occurred during the year covered by the CCR? You are required to explain the violation that happened, including uh, explaining the length of the violation, potential health effects if it's related to a specific contaminant, and also any actions that your supply took to correct the violation. If it hasn't been corrected yet, that's okay. You can still explain actions that you're planning to take in the future. 
If you have <clears throat> violations that are older than the year covered by the report, you don't have to list them. So the five-year rule is only for including data in the report, not necessarily violations. If you need any assistance with building your CCR, you can either reach out to our EGLE staff or you can go online to EPA's CCR iWriter. Uh, if you just Google EPA CCR iWriter, it should pop up. Um, but essentially, this tool is a way to fill out your CCR on uh, step-by-step questions. And in the end, EPA's iWriter will pop out your CCR for you. It should have all of the required language as well as the data that you typed in uh, in a beautiful table format. So you can use it from there. The only caveat with this is that it does not take into account those two Michigan specific rules uh, that I mentioned earlier about needing extra language for six different contaminants if you go above their MCL or action level, and then the, the sodium requirement where it needs to be listed even if it's non-detect. So if you use CCR iWriter from EPA, be sure to go back in and make sure that you have everything for Michigan covered. Once your CCR is done, you're required to distribute it to your consumers, to the local health department, and to EGLE by July 1st. This does not matter if it falls on a weekend or any kind of holiday. July 1st is the deadline, so be sure to do it early. You have time to do it from January through July 1st, so we suggest doing it on maybe an off day in the spring when you have some time uh, on your hands. Remember that any of your wholesaler data is due to you uh, by April 1st. So if you purchase water from a wholesaler, they're required to send it to you by April 1 so that you have time to complete your own CCR. Distribution, besides directly mail, uh, mailing or uh, delivering, also includes a good faith effort to your non-bill paying customers. And what we mean by that is if you go ahead and mail a hard copy to every single bill paying customer in your system, that meets the requirement, but you should also be maybe distributing it to uh, hospitals or nursing homes or schools or any other system um, that's connected to your water supply. You can feel free to post it in public areas like a city hall or a village township hall um, or a post office or somewhere that's frequented by your customers. So you can distribute the CCR by mail or email, and it must be made available upon request. So <clears throat> the mailing option for direct delivery includes sending a paper copy to all of your customers or mailing a notification statement that the CCR is available on your website. With the notification statement, it's important to remember that this URL has to be a direct link so that your consumers just go into their computer, type in the link, and the CCR pops up for them. They should not have to click on anything. This is an EPA requirement. And another thing with the URL is that it should be easy to type. It shouldn't be a very long URL where mistakes can be made. So besides mail, the other option is to email your CCR to your bill paying customers. You can either include the URL if you have it on your website, or you can send it as an attachment or embed it within the email itself. So you've got two options to send it. Here's an example of your URL that would be a good link where the first one has a very simple and easy to type direct link for the customers. The bad example in red is what we might see as a typical URL, but would not make for a good CCR URL as there are many opportunities for your customers to mess it up. And if they don't get it the first time, the odds are they, they might not spend time trying uh, to find their mistakes. So we wanna make it as easy for them as possible to find the CCR online. Now, if you're a small system, we do have waivers available for delivery. If you're under 500 people, you have the option to just post it in at least one public location. So if you're a mobile home park or an apartment that's small, if you wanna post it at the mailboxes or if you have an office that has a bulletin board, feel free to just post it there and that meets the delivery requirements. If you are below 10,000 people, you have the opportunity to publish a CCR in the newspaper. 
please note that you have to publish the entire CCR in the paper to meet this waiver requirement. You can't just post a notification telling people that they can go find it online. Either way, with both of these delivery options, you must tell your customers that the report will not be mailed to them and you must make the report available upon request. Once you deliver the CCR to your customers and to Eagle and to your local health department, you're required to send in your CCR certificate of distribution to Eagle by October 1st each year. Again, this form is on our website at michigan.gov slash communitywater and click on reporting forms. It's essentially a one page form that tells us how and when you delivered your CCR to your customers. Note in the middle of the form is the option for you to choose whether or not you qualify for that small system delivery waiver. If you're including a public notice on your CCR, remember to think of it as a, a vehicle to distribute this public notice. You're not embedding the public notice within the CCR. We think of them as two separate things. So even if you're using the CCR to send out your public notice to people, that's perfectly fine as long as it meets the deadline that you have to send out your public notice. But remember that you still have to explain the violation within the CCR. So the public notice attachment does not mean that you, that you don't have to um, describe the violation of what happened. So keep that in mind. Some of the most common CCR violations that we see are failure to distribute the report by July 1st, not directly delivering the CCR. Uh, for example, if you publish it in the newspaper and just say, our CCR is available, please go find it at our website, that doesn't meet the delivery requirement. Either not including the eight required elements or having uh, incorrect data or units, missing required language, those are all possible CCR violations. So if you have any questions about your report, please feel free to reach out to us as we'd like to help you fix it before you distribute it. So a couple of frequently asked questions that we get about CCRs. Number one, does Eagle send out reminder letters? And the answer is yes, we do. We send out reminder letters in May for the CCRs because we do understand that this is one report that you do once a year and sometimes people forget about it until it gets really close to the deadline. So as I said, you can start working on it early, but we do send reminders out in May so that everybody can meet the deadline of July 1st. Our second question is, is it ever too early to start working on my CCR? And the answer is really no, not really. As long as the year before is complete, so it's past December of the, of the year that you're reporting on, people can start working on it January 1st all the way through July 1st. So you have plenty of time, six months, to work on the report, get it reviewed by us if you would like, and distribute it. So that should be plenty of time. And our third question is, how do I submit a draft to Eagle? And I'm really glad that we asked this question because I think a lot of people don't realize that you can submit a draft. We would like to work with you before you distribute it so that there aren't any errors that we catch and make you redistribute the report. And the answer to that question is, you can email it to Eagle at any of our district email boxes. So based on what county that you're in, unless you're a surface water supply, please look at the list listed on this uh, PowerPoint screen and send it to that email address. You can send drafts as well as final copies of your report and your certificate of distribution to this one email box. It gets triaged and we uh, send it to our right staff person uh, for you so that you don't have to remember who to send it to each year. Uh, a note with these email boxes is that when you send it, you should also be receiving an automatic response from the email saying that uh, we got your, your email. If you don't get the automatic response, uh, please try to send it again or double check that you're mailing it to the right place. Uh, and if, if you're still having issues, feel free to reach out to our district staff so that we can make sure that we are receiving what you're, you're emailing. So in conclusion, 
this opportunity to really tell how proud you are of your system and to give your customers the information about the water that they're drinking and ways that they can help reduce their own exposure uh, is really beneficial for every public water supply. Not only does it improve the public confidence and give them information about what they're drinking, but it can also help them understand uh, where their water comes from and why it's so important to uh, protect it moving forward. The CCR also has an opportunity to uh, increase every public water supply's uh, opportunity for managerial capacity. Part of managerial capacity is reaching out to external entities and the CCR is definitely a way to do that. And um, the more that we can increase the public's understanding of all of the drinking water processes, uh, the better that it is that they can help protect themselves from any kind of contaminant or issue moving forward. If you have any questions about the Consumer Confidence Report, please feel free to contact me at the phone number listed here or by email, or you can reach out to any of your district offices for assistance as well. Thank you for listening to this PowerPoint and have a great day.